Good afternoon, everyone. It is December 4th of 2023. It's Robert Rayburn here from Life Pro Asset Management. Hope that everyone had a great weekend. And as we get into the final month of the year, the big question I think that a lot of people are asking is that, you know, can stocks continue to move higher with all of these concerns around recession and higher interest rates and uh, geopolitical risk, whether that's in the Middle East or in Europe or in Asia Pacific as it relates to China and Taiwan, all of these things. And we think unabashedly that answer is yes. And, you know, the, the main reason why we're not necessarily as concerned is that we think the economy is continuing to hum. You know, the U.S. US GDP came in uh, just over 5% in Q3. And throughout the course of the year, we've been very consistent on that message that we think that the U.S. economy is much healthier than the rhetoric out there. So whether we're looking at unemployment rates or ISM, service manufacturing, service and manufacturing ISM, or whether we're looking at consumer spending, you know, I think broadly speaking, with the exception of inflation, which continues, yes, it has come down, but core inflation sitting around that 4% or double the level of the Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve's 2%. More, more or less, the economy remains quite healthy, especially when you compare it to the rest of the world. So, uh, so this is part of a narrative that the stock market continues to reprice that perhaps there won't be that recession that everyone has feared. Now, the question is, can this rally continue into the end of the year? Short term, we're definitely, definitely, definitely a little bit overbought, but that's okay. Bull markets tend to get overbought. That tends to be a positive symptom. Now, you can also get an overbought condition in a bear market. So we're going to go through how we can kind of distinguish the two. But the three big things that we're going to focus on this week is that the U.S. economy continues to hum along. And that's good. That, that's a good thing because it doesn't appear overheated. doesn't appear that it's falling off a cliff. kind of appears that it just continues to move along. And that's what we want to see. Number two, the market is beginning to broaden out. Now, that could very well mean that the headline indices move lower as people sell those biggest stocks like the Magnificent Seven of Google, Apple, Netflix, Meta, Tesla, NVIDIA, et cetera, uh, and rotate into smaller stocks, right? We've seen a really big inflection point backed by very high volume in the banks, in small cap stocks, now we're starting to see energy reaccelerate. Those are the types of symptoms we want to see in a more broad stock market. And a broader stock market is a healthier stock market. Lastly, we do think value appears attractive over growth. We look at energy specifically in that single digit PE relative to something like Apple trading north of 30 times earnings, right? So those are the types of things that we want to observe and see. So let's go ahead and get into the weeds of the presentation. As we said, Short term, S&P 500 definitely appears a little bit overbought, but that's okay. That can happen during bull markets, right? Markets don't go up every single day. We have to train our minds to be aware that, that markets are a process, especially in bull markets, are a process of going two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, three steps forward, one or two steps back. And when you get those steps back, that's a function of being in an overbought condition. Or otherwise, if you are a if you are a marathon runner and you run too fast, hey, you need to slow down a little bit and then reaccelerate. Slow down, reaccelerate. And so those are the types of things you generally will see. Now we are approaching some important levels here. S and P 500 is approaching that 4600 level, which was the peak that we saw in the summer. Right now, S and P 500 isn't close to that all-time high yet, but this 52-week high of just around 4600 that we experienced in July was also a moment when the market started to weaken and go into that corrective, uh, multi-month corrective state that we, stage that we saw in the fall. So we want to watch that. The market is a little bit overbought, approaching important resistance. So that's why we think we need to be stock and asset allocator. Uh, uh, stock and sector uh, focus versus, say, index focused. Um, when we look at uh, overall quantitative factors, right? So right now, bullish sentiment's pretty high. Um, so again, suggestive of an overbought condition, very short term. We look back December 31st, 2022, uh, people were really bearish, right? So from a trading perspective, you prefer to actually see this than this. You want to 
trade and buy into a very bearish uh, condition versus a very bullish condition. Uh, but again, uh, also symptomatic of a bullish market. Um, so number two is that uh, short term S&P 500, NASDAQ and Russell 2000 flows appear very aggressive. So again, short term, you have uh, bullish sentiment combined with aggressive flows suggested that perhaps we could get a little bit of a breather here, very short term. But again, nothing that would impact sort of long term outlooks. And then we go down again, futures positioning a little bit more bearish. So that's positive. And then again, the 20-day uh, put call ratio is actually pretty aggressive, which would again suggest be suggestive of something a little bit um, more bullish. So, so that's uh, that's really where we're at here. You know, all all signs sort of indicate to a more short-term overbought condition, but nothing that would raise alarm bells to a huge degree. Now, we were talking about how <clears throat> how a overbought condition is actually a symptom of a more bullish or healthy stock market. Well, that's especially true when we're looking at the percentage of stocks over the 50-day moving average. Now, you can see here during these big expansions uh, off of 2020 and then off the major low last year in October of 2022, that we had two things that were consistent, and that was that stocks in both cases, the percentage of stocks above the 50-day moving average stayed above not 80 to 90 percent for an elevated period of time as you can see here uh, represented by this 80 right here and then 90 above this dotted blue line so you get these elevated or uh, elongated stages of uh, overbought conditions which is very very symptomatic of a longer term bull market why does that happen because on every pullback people who miss the initial rally are in a rush to get right back in. And the initial setup for that is that you get a lot of cash that's on the sidelines. Well, interestingly enough, we look at throughout the year, what has been the biggest recipient of investor funds? It has been retail money market funds, sitting at 1.1 trillion in net flows over since the October 2022 low in the stock market. These are skeptical people who looked at the market bottoming and said, I don't believe it. The market's going, or the economy is going into recession. I don't like who's in the White House. I don't like the conditions overseas for any number of reasons, earnings, valuation, whatever you want to call it. I'm, I'm bearish. Get me out of the market. I don't care what uh, the fundamentals say. And then at some point, what's going to happen is if the market continues to work, this cash is going to be forced right back into either this blue line or red line, with in particular the blue line, which is equities. And equities have actually seen a net drawdown this year of 24, 240 billion, pardon me, in investor flows. So lots of cash, lots of negativity, despite what's been a fairly healthy market throughout the year. Now, part of that, of course, has been that that breadth has been very narrow, right? So you even see it in our portfolios where performance hasn't been crazy positive, uh, even though the markets, uh, the headline indices are up double digits. And that's really because we're focused on the non-magnificent seven stocks where performance for the rest of the market has been low single digits, right? So that's been part of the negativity, but we're starting to see that turn as breath indicated right here has started to widen out. Now, the other question we get is, oh, is this like the period leading up to 2008, right? In 2007, you had this last gas rally, market hit an all-time high, and then we went into that recessionary period that led to the bank crisis. I want to really distinguish the two periods here because in 2004 to 2007, which I worked through, uh, you saw a consistent rise in credit spread. So in other words, the bond market was looking at the corporate bond market and saying, hey, corporate corporate balance sheets, in particular bank balance sheets are deteriorating. People are falling behind on their, on their mortgages. People are falling behind on credit cards. Uh, and you started to see that reverberate across the market. So if you look here, credit spreads started to widen out in early 2007. And if I extended this chart through to 2008, these spreads would be like way up where this 2008 number is. So there was a lot of indications prior to the 
bank crisis of September 08 when Lehman failed, that things were not healthy. This time around, we've actually seen the opposite, where credit spreads have been contracting, despite the fact that interest rates have gone up. So I think that's a big thing we want to distinguish. This is not 2008. The, the credit markets are actually in very healthy shape. And that's why you've seen money uh, being able to be made in the corporate bond market and why we really like corporate bonds here. You can, you know, a lot of our bond investors will tell you we can, we can build a portfolio, net of fees, get you a consistent 6% plus uh, income yield. Um, and that's a healthy market. Uh, we, we liked where, where the bond market is currently situated right now. So a few things why this is not uh, 2008. Credit spreads are not widening. Breadth in the stock market is widening. Uh, and up to 2008, you saw breadth narrowing. So people were, in particular, uh, selling what we call cyclical uh, leadership areas, such as materials or technology or banks, and buying consumer staples, healthcare, and those types of areas before the entire market sold off. This time around, uh, current leadership is more cyclical, economically sensitive. So again, reasons why we don't necessarily think that this is 08. Now, the bond market had its best performing month uh, since 1984, I believe. Now, don't quote me, it's either 84 or 82, but the best performing month in close to 40 years. Now, I want to be very, very uh, clear about this. Nothing has really changed from the longer term outlook as it relates to interest rates in the bond market, though. So if we look at this is the 10 year interest rate yield. Right. So we are still higher than we were in September. We are still higher than we were in July and the rest of the year. So if we were if this 4.26 reading uh, was in September, we would be at a 52 week high. We are off sort of these uh, blow off levels in October. When we look at a technical basis, we are coming off a breakout off a big base, pulling back into that breakout point. And would not surprise me if we see another swing around. So some of the action on Friday actually was very interesting where what we saw was a lot of the interest rate sensitive sectors, such as banks or energy, value stocks in particular, were leadership relative to some of the magnificent seven or large cap growth that tend to benefit from lower rates. So the, the sectors that benefited from lower rates were, were actually uh, underperforming on Friday and the banks really broke out. We saw energy uh, break out, even though oil was down uh, 2%. And we, that's very interesting, energy in particular, where we, saw, we were seeing the stocks continue to move higher, even though the price of oil has been going down. And we think this is the first indications of a val of a style shift in the market away from growth and into value and we think that'll be represented lastly by the move in rates and by the move in oil and by the move in copper etc so something to keep an eye on why are interest rates so important because they do determine ultimately the style breakdown in terms of leadership do value stocks outperform or do growth stocks outperform so we think as rates reaccelerate upward that value may resume that leadership. And then, you know, investors that are chasing these expensive growth areas of the market may get burned as we see a rotation of cash flow away from those and into value. And then we actually think one area is that deeply oversold and, you know, potentially a significant opportunity are small cap stocks, which again, are relatively actually in a multi-year bear market. So uh, that, that explosion that we've seen upward in small cap stocks is suggestive of an economic reacceleration. And we see that here, is it time for the average Joe? So when we look at the S&P 500 equal weight relative to the cap weight, all that means is the average stock relative to those magnificent seven stocks. Again, deeply, deeply oversold in that fifth percentile. If you believe in reversion of the mean, we do think that the equal weight will start to take leadership over the cap weight. So in other words, we want to be long those average or small cap stocks versus the very top of the market. So right now, what does that mean? We think that the top of the market is where the risk is. And we think the opportunity is that those group of stocks underneath the very top of the market. So what are areas that we're focused on as, as breadth broadens out? Energy stocks, right smack at the very top of what we're, we're focused on. They're cheap, they're 
executing high free cash flow yields, and there is a structural shortage in supply across the world. Number two, banks and insurance stocks. Uh, they've been dogs for the better part of 12 years. The, the stocks are cheap, but we are starting to see a re-steepening of the yield curve, which is which are good for banks. And if so long rates don't need to uh, go to six for these stocks to work, right? So what we need to see is if rates can go higher, but also be steady and not violent to the upside, these banks can make a lot of money because it doesn't damage the economy. And then durable and emerging consumer brands is we're always on the lookout for, and then small caps over large caps. And of course, why do we like energy so much? We continue to go back to this long-term chart, energy relative to the S&P 500 in a, what we almost a 14 year bear market that we think is in the early innings of breaking out. And uh, we think there are, there are, what is it, five key reasons why we're bullish, right? So inventories keep dropping as supply dries up. Lots of rhetoric out there about demand slowing down. Again, we're not seeing it in the numbers. Demand for oil continues to grow. Major swing suppliers, the Middle East. As OPEC cuts production, it's important to remember that Saudi Arabian production is now back to close to the COVID lows. Now, what would be the risk to our thesis is that, well, you could stoke a supply war. Because if the U.S. is not cutting production while OPEC is cutting production, well, that does suggest that U.S. producers are going to capture market share relative to international producers. So that's one thing that we want to watch. And then lastly, structural lack of long-term investment in the ground. This is what set up most commodity bull markets because so demand responds instantly to change in economic conditions. Supply takes years to respond. And then lastly, m a we do think merger and acquisition activity will continue to accelerate in the energy patch, specifically within the U.S. So a few things. Uh, market is overbought. We don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's symptomatic of a healthy market. The market does appear to be broadening out, as we talked about, and we think that oil and banks are well positioned for a value rotation. That's what we got for you this week, 888-543-3776. Thank you again and have a wonderful week and speak again next week. Talk to you soon.